Hello guys, Matthew Moss right here, and I recently came into the possession of an Acorn Whisk PC700 computer. This was released in 1995 as the successor for the 600 model. My first computer was a 600, before moving on to the Strong Arm Equip model, which was my second and main computer until 2008. That machine was sadly scrapped many years ago. Unfortunately, this two slice build is dead and doesn't post at all. In this video, I'll show you how I turned this knackered machine into the Whisk PC of my childhood dreams. A little backstory first. The reason I'm going with actual hardware over emulation is because for ages I've, I've been having problems with RPCMU with certain older titles not loading unless I've won the emulator in windowed mode, leaving much wasted space on the screen. Last year I tried setting up my grandparents A7000 Plus to play my retro games and software from my childhood. But being unable to find a suitable HDMI adapter and problems connecting it to my USB based KVM resulted in the failure of the project. For a while I thought the only way based on my circumstances was using a Raspberry Pi related build. And I do have two planned with the majority of parts needed bought for one of them. But there's something about the allure of classic genuine Acorn hardware that I can't seem to stay away from. So when I was given the Whisk PC700 that can have both expansion cards and a CD drive installed at the same time, I realised I could have my cake and eat it and I couldn't pass up on the opportunity. So first things first, I opened up the A7000 Plus to scavenge the SE to ID adapter and the 32MB RAM module to use later in the Whisk PC. Then it's time to tear down the aforementioned Acorn. Fortunately, due to its very modular design, this is largely toolless. And in fact, with no modules installed, you can just open the top to install more RAM or swap out the CPU to a faster one. But that will be shown later. For now, we take out the pegs holding the two slices in place that disconnect power and data from the optical and floppy drives, respectively, before gaining access to the motherboard. And here we can see what we're working with. Some things I've noticed the ARM710 CPU on a daughter board which allowed for the aforementioned easy upgrade to new processors. Not too dissimilar to the Macintosh processor upgrade cards or Intel's slot 1 interface. Along that we see two FP RAM slots which is forward compatible with EDL memory, currently fitted with two 8MB sticks and a 1MB VRAM module in its dedicated slot. And on the other side of the onboard is a second processor connector and the Wisco S 4.02 ROMs. Don't get your hopes up though, as RiscOS is incapable of multi-CPU configurations. And this is to allow an x86 PC card to be installed without taking up a module slot. Sort of like Apple's 486 card for the Quadra 610. Back to the matter of hand though. It appears there is no screws being fitted on this motherboard, and it was only being held by something by the power supply. It took a little persuading to get out, but we got there eventually. And to take its place is its working Mark III board, which is the same as what was in the Acorn originally. I'm not entirely sure between the difference between a Mark I and a Mark II board, but Mark III added native 16-bit and CD audio capabilities without needing a daughter board. A quick vacuum of the bottom later as it was extremely dusty. I found the new board was just as difficult as whatever held the old board into place was stopping with the new board, but eventually I slotted into place and I put in a singular screw as I couldn't get the board lined up with the other two holes for whatever reason. For testing reasons, we're putting in a singular 8MB module and the ARM710 CPU. The Risk PC can run without VRAM at lower resolutions and color depth. So now we're at the point of installing the OS ROMs into the motherboard. For me the choice was obvious and went with these Risk OS 4.39 ROMs. Fun fact. These are the sole surviving components from my childhood Risk PC. However, the years weren't kind to them, and two of the pins on one one was missing, which was repaired by my dad. Installing them was admittedly very stressful, as we tried to line up the ones to their respective slots before pushing them into place. With everything needed for a test installed, the Risk PC was transported to the family's IT suite for a power up. Fortunately, with the core OS being in those ROMs, it can be tested with literally nothing else attached. It took a while, but eventually... <laughs> oh! Oh! I'm not sure of the sound I made, but the Risk PC successfully posted and even loaded the desktop. 
meaning the motherboard shaft was successful. With that test out of the way, it's time to talk about upgrades. First things first, I added the 32MB stick of RAM from the A7000 Plus to bring it up to 40MB. Next up is the processor. The ARM 710 is being swapped out with this 276MHz Turbo Strong ARM from APDL. This was a popular upgrade post Acorn to eke out some extra performance out of the WISC PC. And it is basically an overclock chip, hence the need for a heatsink and a CPU fan. I do want to quickly touch upon something as I'm swapping in the new card and plugging in the fan's Molex connector. And that is I won't actually be able to take the fullest potential of the strong arm due to a massive bottleneck. The front side bus. Like the Performer 6200 CD from Apple, the front side bus is too slow for the processor. However, unlike Apple it's due to a different reason. At their introduction of the WISC PC600, the fastest the processor could go was 30MHz. And the expectation was the processor speed would increase incrementally to 40MHz and 55MHz of the ARM 710 and the unreleased ARM 810 respectively. At those speeds, the front side bus was fine. The WISC PC was never designed for a 200 plus MHz processor and leaves so much performance on the table. It's still significantly faster than the ARM 710 despite the handicap, but it could have been so much more. Moving back to the build, I'm going to install this 2MB VRAM module, unlocking the full set of resolutions and colour depth the video chip is capable of, followed by this IT Design NIC capable of 10 megabits per second. It's not fast by any stretch of the imagination, but it will allow me to access my server and portal web. Finally, before we move on to the next layer, I want to ensure this HDD clicker that LGR introduced to me to emulate a period correct hard drive. And this brings up an interesting issue that I ran into, the headers for the power and drive activities non-standard. It took me a few weeks prior to filming to solve this riddle, but I think the solution is pretty ingenious. Despite the 1x4 block is non-standard, the signals they receive and the actual distance between the pins are meaning using a simple male to male and a couple of female to female cables, I can directly connect the power LED cable into the header while diverting the drive activity into the clicker before looping back. Being very careful to make sure the positive and negative lines are exactly in the correct place to avoid blowing up something. Moving that off to the side we can get onto the next layer which houses the optical and floppy drives. Now the DVD drive currently fitted does work and it's one of the select few that supports WiskOS as the Acorn is very funny with optical drives. But its black front plate doesn't match the computer it is fitted in. So it's gotta go. So replacing it is this CD-ROM drive from a company called Mashita. It appeared the old drive was being held in with blue tack. So I removed that and screwed in the new drive. Overall, a pretty simple process and it looks so much better now. Now that would have been it for this layer, except I stumbled across this new old stock faceplate for the strong arm whisk PC. So I replaced the old 700 one just because it would bother me as this whisk PC no longer houses a 710 CPU. I didn't record much of this as it was stopping to take off and put on again. You can really tell how much the plastic has discolored over the years when you see it side by side. I'm keeping the original faceplate in the unlikely event I sell this computer, and they can put that back on if they so desire. So onto the second and final layer. Not much is being done to this except screwing in one of these SD to ID adapters I ended up removing later. The actual SD card I end up using is a 32GB by SanDisk. Other than that I carefully peeled the WiskOS Pi sticker from the front and used a tiny amount of water to scrub any residue off the case. Now we can get on to assembly. So I connected the floppy and IDE cables to the motherboard and carefully slided the slices into place making sure the cables don't catch. Let's talk about podules as we're not done with upgrades yet. So since I have more expansions than two, I am going to fit this four port backplane. And I must say this is in pretty pristine condition all things considering. Connecting to this backplane is this 4 port USB module from Castle Technologies that will allow me to connect to my KVM switch. Along with this Arkin V6B mini module that gives me two additional IDE ports. For now only the CD drive is connected via an ultra short cable I found. 
The last part that needs to be connected is this real-time clock module, which will allow the Rich PC to remember the time and CMOS settings as the motherboard battery was removed. Then finally, connecting the IDE and Molex cables to the IDE adapter and re-adding the pegs to keep it all assembled. And with that, we are ready for software. I inserted the install CD for the drive portion of WriscoS 4.39, then navigated to the HForm tool to format the SD card, making sure not making the same mistake from the A7000 Plus setup process. Once formatted, I naturally renamed the drive to ID Disk 4. Then I clicked on the install application in the root directory and let it install the boot file, which, might I say, installed faster than I remember from my childhood. That ID adapter really makes a massive difference. One reboot later and we're fully loaded into a working install of 4.39. The first thing I did was changing the resolution to 1024 by 768 at 32,000 colors. If you're an Amiga user, here's the bit depth for each color profile so you can decrypt how much depth you get with this machine. Then I copied over some things from the disk image folder of the install CD along with Omnicrypt which isn't part of that disk image but in a different folder confusingly. Then I go into boot to configure my settings to allow me to connect to the network. Because OmniClient is unable to access NFS for whatever reason, I instead use it to access my parents' Omex 6 machine and copy over Sunface and Moonface to access my server. Speaking of NFS, I go into Phoenix's dashboard to enable NFS, as this guy supports NFS v3 and I don't need to enable the SMB1 protocol. Back in WiscoS, I launched Sunfizz and opened the NFS share. Now I can copy over a disk image archive I made in RPCMU so I could transfer the emulator contents over. Then I opened the archive and unzipped the contents. Here you can hear the HDD clicker making some beautiful sounds during the copying process. I am very happy how much personality this brings to the RISC PC, and gives me a sense of nostalgia back to my childhood. I cannot believe how well my solution to connect this device up is. Next thing I did was getting USB stick functionality going. By default, soft SCSI, the program castle shared with the module to enable memory stick capability, is limited to a maximum of 2GB. But someone who's far cleverer than I found, the USB controller is similar enough to the one found in the Ionix to allow greater capacity drives using FAT32FS. I'll leave a guide on how to do this, but it's pretty simple of dragging the necessary modules into the boot's pre-disk folder and updating the necessary one file. And good thing I did, because I discovered when I moved on to customization that the disk archive did not include the long file names and all the backgrounds in the folder were compacted to be the same. So I plugged in a USB stick I had and it copied over all those images perfectly. So I am happy this hack works as good as it does. The background in question is the Super Mac background I saw in an action retro video covering such a machine and instantly took a liking to. Afterwards I installed a theming program by House of Mabel along with a theme that changed the icons to that of WiscoS 4.00 originally for the cancelled Phoebe computer mainly because I just like the pseudo 3D Acorn logo for the task manager. Also, I'm taking this opportunity to configure a program called CD Faker. Think of it like Daemon for Windows or Virtual CD for classic Mac OS. With CD Faker, you manually need to tell the computer there's technically two CD drives and Faker will latch onto the unused one when the program opens. I've set it up to do this automatically at boot. So now with everything all completed, I think it's time we test some games. With the OSSC fitted, we're going for gold with Pac-Mania which runs at the ever odd 320x256 resolution. And as expected, it worked without issue. Even the audio passed through without issue. Unsurprisingly, the Risk PC wants these 2D games without issue or hiccups. 
It all looks crisp and sounds amazing. I'm super excited to play some of my favourite childhood games on real hardware if this is any indication to go by. But let's increase the load with some 3D games starting with the original Star Fighter 3000 compared to the A7000+. In world mode the game is very playable with the extra power of the strong arm and that 2 megabytes of dedicated video memory. And in full screen mode we're looking at least a solid 60 frames per second. It's crazy smooth and fluid and I don't think it could won this move all things considering. Eternal Destiny was another game I wanted to revisit to see how much better it would be compared to the A7000+. Right off the bat, I can tell performance is so much better as it doesn't just take an age to load. Let alone the frame rate being higher than single digits, which in turn means I didn't just fall into a ditch unable to play. It was really smooth and it was actually playable now. And finally, we're winding this off on Quake. Specifically Arc Quake opposed to Arcom's commercial alternative, which this version is running the 1.01 shareware. I do own an actual copy of Quake on Steam which I could use the pack from, but for testing the share version is fine. And yeah, the time demo is a bit choppy, which is a good way to segue into benchmarks. It's all fine and dandy saying subjectively how good or bad something performs, but no doubt you want quantifiable numbers. For the testing methodology, I ran all three time demos three times to give an average FPS. Comparing RPC Emu under the Steam Deck with the APDL card, we see the Turbo Song Arm gives 34% extra FPS. A similar story can be seen with Time Demo 2 and 3. When we combine all three Time Demos together, we get an average of 12.2 frames per second on the Turbo. Expanding to other CPUs shows you can really see the bottleneck of this with PC bus as it is way lower than the 200 MHz Power Mac 4400 available during the same era, if the vague mention in the Macadic magazine is anything to go by. And even if we ignore the 603E, the Sonom still gets outclassed by the 187 MHz AMD chip by as much as 21%. Feel free to use my results to compare your machines as I think it is genuinely fascinating. One does have to wonder how a risk PC would have done if the Sonom could stretch its wings in full, but that is an answer we will never know. So there we are, virtually the best Frisk PC you could get in the early 2000s. It may not be as fast as other non-X86 machines at the time, such as a Macintosh or Accelerated Amiga, but I don't really care about that. I will admit there has been one or two compromises made just purely to those Grail upgrades being very rare these days. But the overclocked processor, large amount of RAM for an Acorn, a drive that pushes the onboard IDE to its limit, and modern amenities such as USB makes it a pleasure to work and play on. It is literally the closest thing to my dream risk PC as a kid and that makes me very happy I was able to achieve it all these years later. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. Take care of yourselves and I will see you around.